call the meeting to order. Board members, you're all present and accounted for. Rebecca will be back shortly. As we begin all of our meetings, we would ask you to please stand, remove your headgear, and if so inclined to join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 So we have two items on our agenda, no old business, no action items. But the two, two items are achievement and, and integration information and our back to school update with our COVID advisory team. Those will be our only discussion items this evening. I would ask for a motion to approve the agenda as shown. I'll make the motion. And on the motion? I'll second. I'll second. Sorry. Katie on the second. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That is carried. Again, no action items. Under new business, achievement and integration information as presented on June 28th. Um, <coughs> Jeff, with assistance, will uh, will have this discussion and he has some items, bullet points that he'd like to discuss. I don't know in what order, but Jeff, I'll turn this over to you. Thank you. Um, since the plan was passed and presented in June of 28, uh, there was some feedback coming at our July meeting. And uh, between the emails that we've been getting, I think there's a lot of misinformation out on the achievement and integration plan. So um, the big reason for having this meeting tonight is to clarify those misconceptions and review the plan one more time with the board and then have the board ask questions um, or even bring up other uh, potential questions that they've heard from the community that we can get clarified tonight as well. So what we'll do is we will start with the misconceptions that I uh, and our administrative team have been made aware of in various different formats. And so we want to make sure that we get these cleared up tonight. And as we go through this, if uh, the board has questions about any of these bulleted misconceptions, please uh, ask questions. And then near the end, if you guys have heard of other misconceptions that are out there, please um, make sure that we bring those up as well so that we can address them at this time. Uh, the first misconception that I believe has been addressed outwardly with the community and tried to be clarified is this plan and the new apartment complex that is being planned uh, down on the south end of Cannon Falls uh, have nothing to do with each other. Uh, there was a big misconception that the achievement and integration plan uh, was tied to that apartment complex. I believe the city has clarified that and the school has clarified that, that there is no tie between the two uh, entities. Second bullet point, we are not considered a racially isolated district. Red Wing, due to a high minority population and their surrounding districts not having a similar makeup, is considered racially isolated. And this is important because we'll get to this a little bit later. When talking about uh, the <clears throat> makeup of our plan. We are only considered an adjoining district in the planning process for the achievement and integration plan. We are not consolidating with Red Wing. This is something new that was brought to my attention at the end of last week. There is no plans uh, at this time or probably in the near future of consolidating with Red Wing. We are not transporting students to Red Wing or from Red Wing to quote unquote integrate either school district. Out of the whole program, there are only two components that deal with Red Wing School District. One is that a few elementary classrooms will be pen pals and Zoom occasionally to have discussions between elementary classrooms. High school students can voluntarily participate in a leadership training strategy 
with Red Wing students. And I believe that that would take place next summer. Is that a class or is that? That is just a leadership like seminar a, okay. for students that wish to participate out of both districts. Is it held in one district or the <laughs> other or is it held like somewhere? I think that's part of the planning that needs to be done. Got it. it might be rotated every year possibly, but those final plans have not been settled because it is next year. And does it, is it credit? Like does it provide credits for the students at all or is this just something just for? At this time we're not providing credits. Okay, for it. so it's, it's not like a summer school class. For or for training for students okay. that want the leadership training. Thanks. And is that high school students only, or is it high school and middle school students? I think in the plan it said middle school, high school. Um, I believe it's probably 7 through 12, and maybe Stephen can clarify that if I don't remember off the top of my head. That's the plan as an hour for it to be 7 through 12. Okay. Hiring will always be based on merit. There's no quotas in our hiring system currently or in the future. Uh, an example of the reason of why this goal even exists is that we have gone from FIED jobs getting 75 applicants uh, all within the past probably five years uh, to getting only one applicant recently when we had a, um, a job opening. That doesn't give us the best opportunity to hire the best teaching staff. We need to have competition in those areas, and so we need to promote our district. We want to expand our pool of candidates, which will include males, females, whites, blacks, etc. The main strategy associated with that is to send a, uh, a district representative, most likely Mr. Um, Strauss, to colleges to promote Cannon Falls schools to get more applicants of all backgrounds for every position that we can have open. The plan is complete and to the satisfaction of the state's initial step. Of all the details in the plan, the few that aren't exact are ones related to a family engagement night, the leadership training for students next summer, which we talked about, and which specific elementary classrooms will be Zooming together. Details for all of those things are impossible to define either months or years in advance. So as they start, will they be communicated out <clears throat> to prior to, to um, starting the programs in the classroom? Yeah, I have a feeling Mr. because Mr. Strauss is a K through 12 assistant principal, he'd be working with staff that may be interested in the, in the pen pal program, for example. Sure. Yep. And will that be, will the program be explained to the parents before it it gets started or like what their you know goal is for it or how they're you know what they're doing with it or sure connecting like, I think or... like any program if you're talking about any age level of programming in a kindergarten through fifth grade classroom sure those things would be explained to parents about what's going on okay in their normal activities okay I remember doing pen pals when I was in elementary I too, school yeah. here. I don't fun. remember the specifics about it, but I think it's great that they'll be able to meet in person because I think our pen pals were not close letters. enough. Oh, yeah, it was definitely yeah. handwritten letters, and they weren't close enough to be able to meet but in person. But I think having the, the option faces. of Zoom. Yeah, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, we aren't the only district that is doing this, and I can go to some information that's on the agenda as well. About half of the districts in the state participate in a program like this, including area schools like Hastings, Red Wing, obviously, because we're partnering with them, Zimbrota Mazeppa, Kenny Wanamingo, and Rochester. Um, one of these lists, I believe, has, you can find the list of participating schools. It's updated as of 1920. Um, and as you can see, it's alphabetically listed. And there are roughly half of the school districts in the state are participating in the Achievement and Integration Program. So of those states, you have the 
the isolated <coughs> district and the adjoining district that is teamed with them, correct? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. And based on the map that you sent, I don't know if you have it yep. there to pop up, it looked like some schools are adjoining, they have multiple adjoining schools that they're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in this color-coded map, you can see the racially isolated schools, the racially identifiable school, and then the adjoining and voluntary type districts. And this is the map of Minnesota, mainly the outstate. And all of the colored ones are currently on that list. In the metro, it's a little bit blown up area of the metro also is in the agenda. That shows the metro schools that are a part of the Achievement Integration Program. Any questions about the number of schools or the map or anything? Uh, another item that we've heard recently is that somehow this is tied into either the 1619 project or the critical race theory. That is not true either. We teach the Minnesota state standards and those have nothing to do with either the 1619 project or critical race theory. The district will receive funds to pay for anything within the program. The amount of revenue that we get is approximately $53,000. Uh, if anything, this will be a savings to the district to help pay for some components of the credit recovery program that we have in place currently. We will still receive our funds even if we do not meet the goals. So our hand is not forced to pass students or to hire certain demographics of teachers. Uh, those are just simply goals associated with the program. A little bit more information from an item up above. Districts with racially identifiable schools, according to the state statute, have to have a community collaboration council to develop integration goals. We don't have to have a racial, or we don't have a racially identifiable school in our district. We are just a partnering district, or an adjoining district is the proper term. So because of that, because that is required, we didn't need to have any other community involvement, similar to most of the other plans passed by the school. Another big component that people seem to be confused about with this is equality versus equity. And the term equity gets thrown around, around a lot, uh, especially in trying to tie uh, the term equity with critical race theory or the 1619 project. And the simplest way to explain equality versus equity. Uh, when we're looking at providing programming for all students and helping them meet goals, uh, if we simply give each student a box to stand on to get them over the hurdle to see what goal they want them to reach, not every student is able to use that. However, if we tailor each program specifically for each student, then all students will be able to be helped to meet their individual goals. Sometimes that only includes giving two boxes to some students, if you will. But it also involves creating different looks for boxes for these students to help them reach their goals. We individualize learning in the district, as most districts do, to help students reach their individual goals. Equity is not tied to anything other than being fair with students and helping them reach their individual goals and tailoring our instruction to their needs. So would this be like alongside the <clears throat> alongside the like 501 plans and the five, like those kind of that kind of uh, equity or is it more just like um, 501 plans and special ed IEPs yeah. have specifically identified needs that fall under sure. federal, federal categories. 
Okay. These are just everything, everyday things that we do with students to help them reach their So if we goals. see a student is falling behind, if we can give them an extra tutor or something like that, is this the kind of thing that you're talking about? Like being able to offer a program to help them catch up? Or? Right, or tailor a program to meet their needs so that they um, are helped more, I guess, if you Perfect. will. Perfect, okay. Yeah. Because all students learn differently and at mm -hmm. different paces. Some students need more help Absolutely. at a certain time. Level. And sometimes these children are switched around in the boxes depending on what they're learning to. Absolutely. Any questions on the misconceptions before we get to the goals and strategies again? Or anything else that was not covered here tonight that should be discussed? I, I think we need to reinforce that the critical race theory concept has never been brought up to our district by any entity. You've never brought this up as a, mm -hmm. an agenda item to be discussed, nor has a board member ever brought this up for discussion. <clears throat> so it hasn't ever been on our radar screen. It doesn't look like it's going to be our radar screen for the foreseeable future, and it has no connection with any of this um, strategy here. No, and I guess the people that are on the curriculum committee can maybe speak to that a little bit as well, if they've heard that come up in that committee. Nope. Mm -mm. Okay. Jeff, can you just clarify? I mean, I, I think the Achievement and Integration Program has been a state program for since, what, 2015 or 2014? Uh, might have been a little bit before that. Okay. I know my last district was involved with the Achievement Integration Program as well. I think it still is involved. Oh, it still is, yeah. Is, is the material that you're showing for 1920 now two years old? Um, would you guess there's more numbers on there or less numbers on there now? After there could years? be more districts involved with that. Generally, once, once <coughs> they get into the Achievement Integration program, they use those dollars to set up programming for students, so it's awfully hard to go backwards to from it, if away. you will. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. um. The one item that I didn't see in the misconceptions, and I don't know if it was brought up in that fashion, but the uh, reduced breakfast and lunch as the oh, main economic main indicator. Economic indicator. Yeah. It, a lot of our plans <laughs> focus on our main economic indicators, which is free and reduced price lunch, is where our biggest gap is for learning. Uh, the students that are not free and reduced versus the students that are free and reduced price lunch. The socioeconomic gap, I guess, is the, the proper term for that. That is our um, avenue that we are attacking in the district because the, um, there is a huge need there, and the students that are uh, that are having their math, reading, and science scores. The, the scores with the ones that are free and reduced are lagging significantly behind the ones that are uh, not free and reduced price lunch. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, it's 33% behind on the free and reduced population versus 9% on the general population. Right, yep, and that is for, in, in this first goal, actually. Yeah. Um, it talks about oh, okay. decreasing the percentage of free and reduced eligible students who are enrolled in Cannon Falls High School at least half time who are behind on total credit. So that's the 33% yes. uh, that you're talking about. 33% uh, of free and reduced uh, eligible students are behind on credits compared to 9% of non free and reduced um, students. And I guess the, the connection that I'm trying to draw to this is for the misconceptions is that it's racially based. Right. And that is not the case. Right. It's, you look, take a makeup of the community, you don't have that. Most of the goals are, are non-racially based. Correct. Right. Um, what, where did we get the this indication or statement that a third of our free and reduced kids are behind? What what mechanism does, is brought to us to say a third of your students are behind? We just look at our graduation um, progression data 
and maybe Stephen can speak a little bit more to that about how that was arrived at, but usually it's just the data that we have in-house on how our students are doing in those um, identified we'll, areas. Yeah, look at that population and then just track which students are behind compared to how many credits they should have after their sophomore year or whatever year happens to be. And your indication is a third of the students that have free and free. One third of, yeah, the free and reduced press eligible students. And this process here that we're we're discussing would give those kids a boost in theory if we yep. if we follow our strategy. I think it's Hopefully. the strategies that we're using to a, attack that yep. gap, especially with some of the first things that those first strategies that Jeff's going to get into. Okay. The hope is because thirty three percent of those students being behind is too high. Yeah. Uh, the first strategy uh, with this goal is the student success class and really what this is is uh, it provides a student success class one semester for each school year uh, it allows students the opportunity to make up credits during the school day as opposed to after school or even some schools offer it before school so it's really in that prime learning time instead of having students stay after school uh, students that are behind on credits will be recruited to this class starting with seniors and then working their way down to sophomores to make sure that we keep that class filled up. The intended outcome is for students to catch up on credits and get closer to the goal of graduation. We will always ensure that organization planning and other helpful skills are taught during this time in an effort to make students successful in their regular credit courses. And then it goes on to talk about students' work will be assessed by a combination of the student success teacher and a member of the department of the course in which the student is making up the class. The second strategy is tutoring. And this is a conjunction with the Minnesota Association of High School uh, of High Societies. So the honor students, or Minnesota Association of Honor Students. Uh, and so it's the National Honor Society students that will be helping to tutor students in grades 6 through 12. Um, and those sessions will be held twice a week. And finally, summer school. This strategy will help get students to summer school who are behind on credits. One of the barriers that we have with people that are socioeconomically depressed is that they have a hard time getting to the school during the summertime to make up those credits. That is a barrier. And so this will help remove that barrier. Again, equity versus equality. Now I noticed in number two, the tutoring, it says any students in grades 6 to, through 12 can attend and get help. Yep. So you don't have to have, like, it can be any student who feels like they need a little help in a specific subject can yep. seek that tutoring? Yep. Any other questions on goal one? Goal number two, the number of full-time racially diverse teachers in the school district will increase from zero at the beginning of 2021 uh, school year to two at the beginning of the 23-24 school year. Um, and this is a goal. It's not mandated. We don't have hiring quotas. Just a simple goal. We have students of color in this district and from various um, walks of life, if you will, and needing to have someone for them to look up to, somebody that looks like them, is very important to these kids. And I think that should be an important goal to have in the district. We talked about the college recruitment process earlier. Uh, the assistant principal will contact teacher prep programs from different colleges. Uh, an attempt to organize chances to go speak directly to students and to recruit teachers of color uh, to the Cannon Falls School District. Basically, we want to um, talk to each of these uh, colleges, give them all of the positives that we have going on here in Cannon Falls, and try to get more applicants in our application pool. Any questions on goal two? Just to follow up on that, when we get one applicant for a PE job, and we used to get many, that tells us that there's a finite number out there that are willing to 
put their application in. So um, part of the strategies behind this is let's go out and look for other people to apply to Cannon Falls. Mm -hmm. And if we go into uh, college settings, career day, <coughs> all of this stuff, to essentially say, hey, think about us. Come here. Mm -hmm. So we want to increase the pool. Do we currently participate in anything like that for getting applicants to? Not that I've, since I've been here, um, but obviously COVID has probably knocked those down a little bit. But sure. even prior to me coming, um, it's my understanding that no, that hasn't been the process. So ultimately this goal is basically just to increase our candidate pool mm -hmm. across the board. Yeah. Right. Even not, and not necessarily specifically, you know, if it works out to get qualified applicants from whatever race or color or whatever it may be. I think it's the, the big picture is talking to applicants. Sure. Um, and just trying to increase our overall. Yep. Well, if you continue to do things the same way, you're going to get the same result. Right. Absolutely. Yep. And so, I mean, you look across the street, there's a now hiring sign. Right. You, know, you go down the street, there's a now hiring sign. We're all after a number of applicants, and I think that's the picture there, right? Right. We want the best teachers in Cannon Falls. Yes. <clears throat> and have you stated, too, that hiring will be done based on merit and experience, as always, not based on this as a goal, and even if we did not meet the goal, of, it would not affect our standing or our participation. No, it wouldn't affect the participation right. or the revenue being or the received. Rent. Okay. Yeah. And I, I want to kind of build on what you said about it being beneficial for students to see representation of themselves in the leadership of our school. I think it's beneficial for all of our students to get used to interacting with and being aware of and accepting of people that are different from themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. that's, that's part of the education process. Yep, absolutely. It's all wrapped up in that, for sure. Any other questions on goal two? Goal number three, on a five-point Likert scale survey, students will report an increase in their comfort level in discussing diversity with other students from the baseline average of 3.28 as collected in June of 21 to an average of 3.8 by May of 2024. Um, some of the strategies uh, that we talked about will include holding equity and leadership training for middle school and high school students. This will integrate students from the two communities uh, that have had various experiences, obviously. Cannon Falls students can share their experiences, and Red Wing students can share their experiences as well in a leadership setting. Um, and also prepare students to be great leaders with an emphasis on equity. i just clarify it again that this is the option, the, the leadership training that we've talked about and referencing here is the optional program. The volunteer. So the yeah. students are self selecting and to participate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Is there a target number of students that we're looking to have involved in that? Um, I would say it depends on the training that, okay. that comes up because if they only can work with 30 students or if they can handle 300 students, mm -hmm. you know, I think it depends on the type of training and what the presenters would feel comfortable with. Do we have a timeline for when we might know more about what this program will look like. I know you said next summer for the training, yep. but I'm guessing we'll have a I'm guessing idea of what it'll look like. January okay. time frame. I don't know if Stephen has uh, talked to Red Wing about that uh, timeline. One of their uh, assistant principals has been kind of the main contact person, I guess, throughout this process from our district to theirs. And she had said that between the two strategies that the two districts are partnering on, they're kind of taking the lead on planning this one per se, so they're going to come up with a bunch of different options and then present them and then between the two districts we'll come up with something. So, And they had said that once the school year gets started, they're going to get going and specifically looking at those. Thanks. Uh, strategy, uh, the next strategy for this would be diversity club. Cannon Falls High School Middle School will create a diversity club for all students to join if they wish. Uh, this will be implemented in the high school, middle school building and be for students in grades 6 through 12. 
and obviously, and like any club, uh, activities are planned by the students. And so uh, the activities for that diversity club are to be determined. I think diversity is a, a word that gets thrown around a lot these days. And, and it's something that <clears throat> we discussed at work uh, on what we were doing as a new team that we're coming together. And the word came up. And the, the subject matter changed because where the, the, the initial concept or thought is color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's not what this, this communication was about because we each bring something different to the table and it's the role that we would play in this team that we're creating, the number of years of experience what their past has been. And so I think this club has to be understood that everyone is considered diverse for what they're bringing to the table. Absolutely. Um, I don't think it's the color of the skin piece. It's more of the, even the ethnic, if you have an all-white club, could be the ethnic piece of, I'm not Swedish by any stretch of the imagination, so you know, making the, the left a piece versus my German heritage of making sausages, you know, could be shared from that mm -hmm. standpoint as well. When we talk about um, the differences that make up uh, our country as a whole, it, it is more than just color of skin. Or the talents, like the talents that each kid has. Oh, absolutely. Just anything that brings them up to be different from one another. Mm -hmm. and, and even, you know, our, our biggest economic indicator here is the socioeconomic piece and understanding each other's upbringing and, and what it's like uh, from that aspect as well. Mm -hmm. um, family engagement night. Cannon Falls High School, Middle School will host a family engagement night once each year. Uh, this will be held on campus with food and games that will be provided as well as opportunities to get to know other families. And again, this is open to everyone. Is this elementary too? It's like the whole student body? I'm guessing, it, is it only 6 through 12 students? That one will just be 6 through 12. Okay. okay. So it's just the high school, middle school yep. family okay. engagement. Uh, classroom integration, Cannon Falls and Red Wing Schools will have elementary and middle school classrooms communicate in an effort to bring the communities closer together and give the students a chance to meet others outside of Cannon Falls. Uh, the classrooms will connect virtually for a discussion, which I think is unique from what uh, Anna had talked about in her experiences. You're trying uh, to tell me I'm old? Is that, is that no, what you're saying? No. Okay. I remember having a pen pal uh, as well. Not calling anybody old. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, again, the, the uniqueness of this one would be the, the virtual capabilities that we have currently. Um, uh, they will write letters back and forth, which once each school year, these students will meet face to face. And again, part of this grant money would be used for that transportation piece as well. Uh, this will help build educational and social skills as well as integrate the students within each other's unique settings. I believe that is the last one. Any questions on goal three? Well, is it fair to say that some of these misconceptions are based upon a word in these strategies and goals being integration? Yeah. It's a, it's a poorly used word, and Stephen and I actually talked about that today. It's a poorly used word uh, throughout the plan um that is not used consistently is probably the best way to say that throughout the planning process you hear of forced integration uh -huh. uh, sometimes within metro schools and this is not it um, it's more of a looser definition of it team do you have any other questions It's somewhat irregular, but in this, in this part, I, I would like to ask people who have attended here if they have a question about the misconceptions 
you can hold off on your opinions in the public forum. But as for Mao, is any, does anyone out there have a clarification they would like on what's been uh, the information that's been disseminated here right now? Uh, my name is Belinda Kuhn. I was here when we, when you discussed the achievement integration plan in July. So it's like watching a reenactment of that whole meeting. And I appreciate you taking the time to walk through everything. I was looking specifically at the misconception of, of uh, bullet point one, two, three, four, five, six. Hiring will always be based on merit. That that. Um, that's one of the misconceptions that's been identified here, and yet in goal number two in the strategy of specifically zeroing in on hiring a person of color. So that my question is, is, is if you have a person of color and a person of no color like me, um, is it based on merit or are you preferring uh, because the language in the goal and the strategy is to hire specifically a person of color, yet the misconception is that are we hiring on basis of merit? And who are we letting go? And would you let someone go in lieu of getting more racially diverse? Or is it sexually diverse? Or is it, you know, that sort of thing. So that's, I, I would prefer a bit more clarification on that point specifically, since it is mentioned specifically in the second goal to hire a person of color and at least two in the next two years. So if you could clarify that, that would help me. One way to clarify that, though, is I have a goal of about every year trying to lose 20 pounds. And if I don't reach that goal, then I set the goal again to try to do it again the following year. Now, if we reach that goal, that's great. But if we don't, then we need to probably try again. But that's where the merit base comes in, because we want to hire the best teacher. If the best teacher doesn't help us reach our goal, so be it. And so that's where the merit piece comes in. Can I follow up with a question on that then? So in the June meeting, it was discussed that it was very important for us to get that question on the application process of maybe race again. So is that going to be not really in the application process? I'm not sure if it can be anyway. But the way it was discussed in June, it was kind of expressed that there's there's got to be a way for us to indicate that so that we kind of know who those candidates might be. You can't. I don't think you can. I don't you, think you can, can. I don't you think do, you that, can do it. But that's the way it came across in the June meeting when I had listened yep. to it. I think that I, th I think that was my question on how we came to the uh, mm -hmm. the number that we currently have. How do we find what our makeup is, and is that something that's led on the front end, or is that something that we're finding? from the questionnaire and that's how we did it was the questionnaire um, and so it doesn't exist but that's not the intention right so that's not going to be something you guys are going to be it was something mr strauss had said during the meeting about that piece that had me wondering is that something that's yeah because that that was really me asking the question of how right. do we get to this point of not having any and how do we get there and how do we determine if we met our goal? And so then this, I would assume the survey would be done again. We, we need to have benchmarks, and, and then right. we need to gather the data. Right. You will. And to clarify, this is self-reported data. Self-reported data. Yeah. 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 Generally, priorities are goals, right? So I'm still a little confused when Belinda's talking about your merit-based hiring versus your goal of racially diversification like if it if your goal is to be merit-based that should be the number two goal that's your focus that's what you're trying to increase the applicant merit but your stated goal is to hire more people of color so it's it's conflicting like what is it is it a priority the priority according <coughs> to the screen is color mm -hmm. not merit so you're saying one thing but you're showing another thing so what is it? Again, it comes back to we have racially diverse students in the district. 
and a goal, you know, I, I can have a goal of losing 20 pounds, but I can either force it off by having surgery or try to work toward it naturally. And working toward it naturally, we want to increase our applicant pool. I also feel like, I, like to be a reading goal number two, and the goal says the number of full time will increase from zero to two. That does, I mean, obviously we can infer from our current data that that would be a result of hiring. But I mean, the goal itself doesn't say that we're going to hire. It's just saying that the number will increase. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, there's a difference between saying the number will increase right. versus saying we know we're going to hire right. two, no and matter so what. And so the strategy, obviously, is to expand our recruitment pool based upon what we know, right, from going from 75 to 1. So, like, the strategy is sort of just to increase the pool, which by default would, right, but it's not stating explicitly, right, hiring. Right. Right. Well, and I think it's also um, this program is... A subset within the district right. and it's not fed to the hiring practice and the, the yeah, structure that they've put around on what they do to hire right. mm -hmm. and so the structure of hiring individuals is laid out and has n nothing in there about a and I or affirmative action right. or a racial number correct mm -hmm. and I think and, and maybe this is my mistake in, in thinking, but in my opinion, hiring for merit is assumed. Yeah. We're always going to be hiring the best possible teacher we can find. I, I don't feel like it needs to be stated because it's an obvious point. Thank you. Is it possible to, I mean, what you're reviewing here, what you've adopted already at the end of June, the Achievement and Integration Plan has come down from MDE, correct? So it's not like we can, you could change the strategy to include merit and color or something like that. I, it's just, it came as it was and you adopted it at the, at the meeting, uh, what, six weeks ago or so. And so there's no changing it. So basically you're just trying to um, explain uh, your purposes as a school board uh, and what your intentions are. Is that correct? Am I saying that correct? Just to clarify. Yeah, I think the intention. Well, I think that's a strategy too. Well, Stephen, could you explain how these goals were set? They were they weren't just handed to us. Were they, or were we involved in that process? Or? There's three different categories that the state gives us if we want to participate in this plan that we have to kind of fall within those categories of goals. Does that help? So they give us a general and and we align more specifics to fit can us. Can we add yeah. clarifications? Because like our strategies are different than revenue strategies, with the exception of the two. Did you get that answer? Do you well, can we add clarifications like that to a goal? So if, that's, if you, yeah, that's up to you guys. flip to the back in the FAQs, there is it says, can a school district make changes to its achievement and integration plan after it has been approved by MDE? It's on page five of the FAQ um, at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And it, it lists approved plans may be modified in the following situations and what to consider if you want to make amendments. But the plan as it is is supposed to be in place for three years, so they don't want us to continually change strategies mm -hmm. um, because then that takes us off the course of following the plan, but there are specific ways and reasons that we could make amendments if we think it's necessary. But is it fair to say that the Department of Education understands that it's based on merit and not on... on I don't think you can goal? have any other assumption other than that because it's right. illegal to hire on anything else. Right. But it's illegal to hire based on race, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So or discrimination. I, I would say that it's probably not necessary to make that sort of amendment. The question becomes then, why is the goal even there? If it's illegal to hire based on race, get rid of the goal. It's not applicable. The, the, goal, the goal is based around the idea, and it's an idea that we have a class, a school district that has people that look like them. And the only way you get there is to be open to it. And that's why opening the pool, trying to get 
bigger numbers rather than just posting on the MDE site and hoping, praying that we're going to get 75 applicants. We have to get out in the community and, and find applicants. It doesn't matter who, who, what they look like, but in the end, I think the, the goal or strategy, if you will, is that we end up getting a different population. But the intent is not only to, to hire a yeah. broader population. Michelle, you So you talk about diversity, and then you tie that into lack of applicants. And so are you getting feedback that um, people aren't applying here because the staff is not diverse? I mean, where, where does that come in? Do you, do you not hire because of diversity? The feedback is we get one applicant. And well, we I know, we but should it, get more. why is that? Is that because we're not diverse enough in the staff? I just think there's a diminishing number out there that are educators right so now. So I don't know why any of the hiring is based on diversity. No, I don't think the community is saying don't hire because of diversity. Okay. What would be your clarification that you're looking for, Michelle? Well, this? I just want to know how, how, you, how this is tied in, um, that you talk about diversity, and then you say one, one applicant for a job. What, what is your feedback that that's why you're not getting the applicants? I hope what we're going to do when we have one applicant is seek other applicants. And we've got to broaden our horizons and just say, we can no longer just wait for people to send their applications our way. We have to go out and seek people regardless of their ethnic background or their diversity. If it happens to be 10 people who are of the same race, background, whatever, then that's what it is. But we think that we can expand our horizons by having more than one applicant for a position. Well, well I, would, I would agree you want a pool of applicants to choose from, but I don't know um, how the diversity or lack of the diversity in Cannon Falls affects that, I mean, affects that, that application pool. I don't understand that. Well, I think That's what I would like clarified. I think the misconception of the, like the misconception that we were only going to hire based on the diversity brought this whole thing to mm -hmm. to call like it brought it all up that this this rumor got out or whatever that that's what we were doing when we were never doing that it was just this is just a goal that we have for our students that are diverse in our in our area and this is just a goal that we have for to increase from zero to two. That doesn't mean that we're going to hire any differently than we've been hiring. But we are trying to just get out there and go. the strategy is to college recruitment, go out there and try and get people to come <coughs> see us and come look at what Cannon Falls has to offer. Well, I would have guessed you were doing that with health question of diversity in there. That sure. you were trying to recruit staff members. Yeah, Absolutely. Right? But I think the diversity part comes with this integration plan. Mm -hmm. Jen? So. I think the problem with goal number two is just the one word racially. If you drop the word racially and leave diverse, you're opening up to diverse. It could be economically True. diverse. It could be racially diverse. It could be religiously diverse, you're opening up the field if it's non-specific to just racially diverse. Racially, I think, is what's putting you in your peg wall. Maybe. Stephen, could I ask you for a perspective on that? Uh, the way the state lays out the plan for goal number two, we couldn't do that. Okay. So the state is pushing that we need to be racially yeah. diverse. That's part of the one goal. Okay. So are you going to be imploring um, equity into that decision then? Meaning what? Into the hiring practice hmm. to bring in more diverse, racially diverse? No, the hiring would still be on merit. Okay. And color. So, um, oh, word, sorry. so would a person of color, would they have a higher percentage of being hired if 
I don't know, say Jen, Jen and I were applying people. for yeah. the same job, would I have a more a higher percentage of getting hired? No. No. Okay. Yeah, that's the question I had with equity. Mm -hmm. It goes to merit. It's going to be based upon but your. But if we're of equal merit, then it would it be based on your fit. Right. So it would be your fit, yes. It would be your fit with the people you're interviewing with and whether or not. And the needs of the school. Yep. It would be your fit with, like, let's say one of you had a specialization in, like, some sort of a club or a. Or you were willing to coach. Or you're willing to coach or something well, that we needed. If it was equally. That very rarely yeah. happens, but... Well, I understand, but this is an example. <laughs> right. yep. Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying, but no, I don't I don't think you... It, that you goes back a, to what I was saying, is that the, the hiring process is set up. Everyone's doing the same questions. Um, so it, it's set up to hopefully get away from any of that because everyone's doing it the same way. Well, this assumption assumes that you're not doing this right now. You're not reaching out to people of other color. So you're, you, you have to focus on it now because you're not doing it now. Why aren't you reaching out to people of color right now? I think the assumption is that we haven't been reaching out at all. We haven't been reaching at all. At all. And so yeah. with, with the low number of applicants coming in, we, we need to do something different. And, and I think... I think maybe the misinterpretation of this is that we're going to a all racially diverse university and only recruiting from them. That's not what we're doing. We're going to neighboring universities that have diverse individuals attending those. Not all of them are going to be in education. But we're, being, we're marketing ourselves, and we haven't done that before. Like I said earlier, we've put out a posting on mm -hmm. the website and sit back and wait. And now we're getting one applicant. We're getting two, two three applicants. And in the past, that we didn't need to because right. we, we, we got five applicants. Yes. yes. Right. So it's a shrinking pool of qualified candidates. So that leads me to a question of, and because he said we can't change number two because the state says we need to have it be a racial, mm -hmm. racially diverse school. So, the, so I feel like what you're saying and probably what a lot of us are concerned about is maybe on the same page. That it's not the insanity that it sounded like in the beginning. But the state is dictating to us that we need to do these things. And this is only an optional, is this an optional or are we mandated to do this because of Red Wing? What is our say against the state? Do we have to do what the state says? Because the state's doing some other goofy stuff too. If you've seen the new draft of the social studies, I mean, there's other things from the state that I don't necessarily trust either. Where do we, as a district, have an independent voice to say no? Thank you, state. I understand you're looking at dollars, and that's a huge deal to get that money. But when it's, I mean, Cannon Falls is not an enormous community. It's getting to be bigger compared to surrounding. But do we have standing to tell the state? No thanks. That's not. I don't. I don't follow your language. Your goals don't really meet with what our school district cares for. Doesn't represent who we are. Mm -hmm. This is an optional program that we've decided to pursue because of the number of programs that it could um, help provide for our students. Again, there's approximately fifty-three thousand dollars attached to it. And. And, and so, you know, in an age of um, schools needing revenue, uh, there's, there's different opportunities out there. And yeah, it comes from the state, and the state's going to guide how that's going to work. And it's not that, just, <coughs> sorry, and it's not just the revenue piece, but it's revenue that is going to help us better in terms of students. better serving our students and better serving some of our students who are on free and reduced lunches, who have so, so you, you know, who are falling behind. Or for even for like the tutoring piece of all the kids that everyone. need that tutor. So it's it's going to ben it can benefit everyone. We're so getting in we're getting into more debate than we possibly should be getting into right now. Um, so we'll take a couple of more questions, then we're gonna move on and if you care to uh, 
state your case during the public forum. I would have you read that public forum again, because if we deviate from them like we did last time, then we'll end well, the public forum. And, and I'd like to just get back to your question with the state. And I think you have to go back to look at one of the reasons why it's being presented is because of Red Wing. Red Wing is a racially isolated district. And that's why the state is putting that part of it into it. So that's where the integration term and getting to know one another comes into play. So that's, that's the carrot. We'll take this last one out here. Yeah, I was wondering about the who's going to be developing the inclusive and racial or uh, the diversity leadership training. Is that Red Wing or is that Cannon Falls? It'll be a collaborative effort between Red Wing and Cannon Falls. And the students that uh, would be volunteering for that, would parents be notified of that before students are involved? Like in October sport, I would think. Is that, I would think is that it would a be like. Thing that the I would assume if. We're going on field trips, then yeah. Because I would like to understand the content of what is in the leadership training. Sure. Yeah, just like any other field trip we go on, and parents can make a choice of either having their kids go on it or not. So, Jen, one more. <laughs> okay, one my more. final statement. <laughs> I was just going to say, I understand where the state gives you opportunities and kind of has you in a few ways too. But I feel like when it, I get, that's where your money is coming from. But I think as for me, maybe for others, that's where you start to worry about the CRT business. I get it's not in our classrooms and we really have no interest in getting in our classrooms. That's great. But it starts to creep in from the top. And that's probably the key issue underlying everything that people are concerned about. And when looking at the statistics of this program, when I looked at their success or their feedback at their 2019 legislation, their success rate was not great with this program. A lot of people didn't meet their goals, and they get, they're just goals. But it's, it's that with those dollars come little itsy bitsy pieces of telling you what's going to be in your classrooms. We're going to uh, close this off right now, but uh, by virtue of me being the chairman, at times I get to say things without rebuttal. And I'll tell you the one thing that was appealing to me was goal number one. Our free and reduced kids are apparently falling behind at, an, at a greater proportion than any other. We need to lift those kids up. And if goal number one says that we're going to lift these kids up and we're going to get some financial help to do it, I don't think there's a person in this room that would argue that point. We want our kids to be together. We want them to not fall behind. We want to promote our kids as best we can. And that's the most important goal that I see. Some of these others, I would agree, there's issues that you have concerns about. But let's focus on what we can do for our kids here, primarily. And I, I hope you've had an opportunity to at least get some questions answered. And uh, whether or not you agree with everything that's showing right here, um, that is not unique to a school district. People don't agree with many things that we do, with many paths that we take. But we're going to do it for the greater good of our kids, of your kids. And please understand that. That's where we're going. The next part of our meeting is our back-to-school update from the COVID-19 Advisory Committee. Uh, yes, the COVID Advisory Committee met last week, and um, Rebecca and Bill were both there as well. And lots of good discussion was had with some input from community members as well. And at the end of the meeting, uh, the recommendation at that point to bring forward to the board on August is it 23rd or 26th? 23rd. 23rd. Yep. At our okay. regularly scheduled meeting, yes, the 23rd. Uh, was to have masking be optional. Uh, strongly recommended, but optional. 
Vaccines, strongly recommended but optional. Um, there was a lot of questions around quarantine at the time at that meeting, and so we are meeting again next Thursday. Thursday prior to the board meeting again to finalize the recommendation and to clarify the quarantining pieces as presented from MDH with updated information. So uh, you can expect uh, a resolution at the board meeting on the 23rd, much like we had last August, that outlines how we're starting school and then the final decision will be yours. So basically it'll come from the COVID committee um, up through here. So. I, I, I'd like to call on our two um, representatives here and I forewarned them that I would call on them. <laughs> But I'd, I'd really like to understand the dynamic of that meeting because in the past it's been a kind of a finite group that met on a weekly basis with administrators. Um, a couple of representatives are, are, uh, are educators as well. And, and people that have experience, especially you, you're on a COVID committee at, at your place of work. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd like to know what happened there because the, we expanded our numbers at that meeting. Well, I think it's also important to, to note, Bob, that we had community members. We had parents on that com committee last year. Mm -hmm. We had a student representative also. Um, and now we added other, <coughs> other members. We had the school nurses on. We had a Goodhue County nurse on, on this committee all of last year. So I'll let you. Uh, you know, I, I think for me, it probably was the most positive meeting I've had as a board member in terms of walking away feeling like there was a lot of good communication and clarification that was happening. I, I you know, I, as a new board member, I never really thought that this was sort of the conversations that I'd be having in terms of why I wanted to join the school board. but. Um, I think it was a really good opportunity for, for us to hear from the community um, about sort of the, the impact of last year, um, the stressors and, and, and points of, uh, I think opportunities for us to figure out in ways which we could have been maybe clearer in communication. I think we had a really good conversation about the distinction between uh, required, recommended, encouraged, guidance. optional guidance. and. I think it was also, I don't, I don't, I, I hope that it was helpful for community members in the room to help understand sort of what we were being told in terms of what you had to do versus what wasn't um, required. Um, I, I think we've all agreed that the term guidance is sort of a four letter word now. Um, I think we are all on the same page with that. Um, but I would say, you know, I think that, um, you know, I, I think we received some very tough feedback, you know, in terms of, of the impact of, of this last year. I think they were things that we were aware of, but um, to, to have that opportunity to, to hear that from the community was really helpful. I, and I think that the community also heard from us that it was our, and it always is, our intention to keep students in school. Um, and that, um, you know, none of these decisions were decisions we wanted to have to make, um, but that the goal is to keep students in school. We know that that's where they're going to learn. Um, we know that for some of our students, school is a place where they feel, you know, they feel safe. That's where they're they're getting their support. They're getting all of their, um, you know, kind of additional, you know, enrichment from that. So, um, you know, I, I'm kind of going on and on about it, but um, you know, having been part of the COVID committee since January, um, I really appreciated that opportunity and. Um, I feel hopeful that we can move forward um, with some good communication back and forth and that, you know, I hope that the community knows that they have questions or concerns. We, we talked about sort of dialing direct um, and asking the question or, or voicing that input and that it is welcome and received. Um, and, you know, I, I know as a board member, if I don't know the answer, you know, I'll, I'll point you in the right direction and get that clarification. So, um, I don't know. Well, that, that was all well said. I think, um, uh, I'll just echo the, the idea that it was positive. Um, I wasn't aware uh, going into the meeting that we were going to have as many attendees, which was welcome. And it was also noted that it is a, a public meeting. It's posted. Um, 
It was public all of last year. And it was public all, we did them mostly as Zoom until recently, but they, they are public. Um, so we welcome more community members to attend and understand, because I think that's where some of this, uh, probably similar to this uh, meeting tonight, came some misinformation, some talk around town that got clarified. And I, I specifically asked Jeff during the meeting to take a step back in time to where we started the COVID committee and what guidance we were getting from the state of Ed, the Department of Education, the Department of Health, to where we were in May, right, when we closed the school, to where we came to May and closing the school for a reset and then bring it even closer to how that came to be. And I think the community members really took a step back and really understood that it wasn't just a willy-nilly uh, conversation and that it took a lot of understanding of the administration um, and quick decisions because the number of students that were either sick or quarantined and number of staff that were either sick or quarantined, we couldn't run the school and it was only going to get worse. Um, and so that just there to me was a big piece in the community members now understanding how that decision was made and knowing who was on the, commu the, com the committee. And I think we opened up that channel of communication. I just, I, I heard some positive things coming out of it. Um, I, I spoke to a couple of people who were on the committee and it was um, not on the committee, but in attendance at the, at the meeting. And there were some very positive vibes get, that came out of there. And I, I think if we uh, hold our own feet to the fire, we would have to say that we need to improve our communication and build off of that. And um, Jeff, have you got anything else for the advisory committee? Nope, I don't. Okay. Uh, other than we're meeting again Thursday to get a last round of clarification on the quarantine piece and relook at data again. This coming Thursday? Uh, yeah. I had I received some questions about transportation yeah. and masks being required, how that is going to be enforced because we can't count on our bus drivers to do that. They need to be able to drive the bus. And then about how will we be going back to how pick up and drop off was done before or will it be done? Are we encouraging parents to drive students again this year? Are we looking, what are, do we have capacity limits for the buses? I, I got a lot of questions this week about transportation. There's no capacity limits. Okay. Uh, we would require, uh, not require, but we would have the bus drivers enforce policies on buses and if students aren't following along with it, they would report it to assistant principal or principal when they get back in, okay. whatever the process is. Um, well, obviously, if kids are refusing to wear it, that's a conversation that needs to happen after that. We can't stop the buses or anything. Um, but I think it went out and it was a, a part of that discussion is that that's not this board's decision. That's a federally right. required yes. Yeah, yep. yeah. I think everybody understands that we have okay. to mask on yes. so. And that did bleed a little bit. Um, we are tentatively planning right now to still have the buses come up here okay. again and encourage parents. I, I think parents would naturally, and they're all over the board, obviously, <coughs> on the board, so they want their kids masking or not. Um, and if they're on the bus, they know that they have to mask. And so I'm guessing that might lead to some parents still driving their kids down. And quite honestly, um, it, it's a better situation down there instead of trying to mix buses and, and cars down there. Mm -hmm. I think that turned out pretty, it turned out a lot better than expected yeah. last year. So I agree that might that be a good personal experience. Maybe a good process moving forward uh, that even in non COVID years that we probably look to uh, possibly do that. I can't say for sure, but uh, at least this next year, that's the intent at this okay. time. Thank you. Yep. But that'll be communicated to us. Okay, good. Thank you. Anyone else? Before we end, end with the public input, 
I just want to reinforce that um, our children learn from us. And as parents, we set parameters for them. When they step into the classroom, we set parameters for them. And we expect them to follow those parameters. I thought at our last public input, it got off track. And it was kind of disappointing when you have to stop and remind people that these are our, these are our guidelines. So what we teach our children sometimes, we should swallow ourselves and follow that path. Um, the public input is going to be open, and we're sticking to the topics at hand. Now, you can have three minutes to speak. And once more, due to data privacy concerns, a speaker may not address criticism toward an individual school district employee during public input. Individual complaints should be handled privately with the building administrators and or the superintendent. Comments from visitors must be informational in nature and may not exceed three to five minutes per issue. The board cannot engage in a discussion or a debate in those three minutes, but will take information and find answers appropriately. As part of the board protocol, it is unacceptable for any speaker to slander or engage in character assassination at a public board meeting. I'm reinforcing what we teach our children, and we should follow ourselves. Having said that, with a show of hands, who would like to speak to the board on a topic of? Ma'am? So, um, my name is Dawn Manning. And um, first off, I have to thank you for the clarification and having this meeting because I think a lot of the misunderstandings come from the language that's in there. And the idea, I am, you know, I went through this, uh, the Achievement and Integration Plan. I'm all for giving kids a leg up because that's how you avoid the issues that we have now. So, that's okay, you know, I, I like it. And then the other thing that I, I do have to thank you is the clarification that this is voluntary. It's a goal, it's not mandated, so you're not obligated to hire a teacher based on the basis of race. So for that, I thank you for clarifying that, and I think it, covered, it cleared up a lot of concerns that were in the room and in the community. Now, um, along the same lines of you were talking about critical, you know, this doesn't involve critical race theory and all of that kind of stuff. The one thing I, I do want to talk about is the um, new social studies standards that are being proposed by the Minnesota Department of Education. Um, is this part of our topic it is. this evening? Yeah, he said that you teach the standards that Minnesota Department of Education mandates, okay? <laughs> So, <laughs> so um, while there are certain elements in that new proposal that I was glad to see incorporated involving civic duties, the roles of three branches of our government, and the legislative process, learning about the Bill of Rights, the U.S. Constitution, and the Minnesota Constitution, it encourages the ideas of respecting diverse viewpoints, how to differentiate fact from opinion, and how to do your own research. However, there is a very clear bias in the new standards and the benchmarks that are listed in those standards, that are listed in that standard, that are basic elements of critical race theory, Project 1619, and colonialism ideologies. While it teaches about our government and legislative process, it also encourages the dismantling of our institutions. It is thick with identity politics, starting at the kindergarten level, getting very aggressive in leftist, leftist indoctrination at the fifth grade level, and reinforcing that indoctrination at the ninth grade level. Neither of those are coincidental. Fifth graders are just starting to develop their sense of self before heading to the middle school. And ninth graders are the most impressionable and almost old enough to start voting at 16 if some of our legislators get their way. Um, I encourage you all, along with any parents in the audience tonight, to read through these, the standard. Using the sentiment that Mr. Sampson used at the last school board meeting when discussing the TIF, if it even brings five students to the district, that is a good thing. Okay? 
then by the same logic, losing even five students would be a bad thing. In the last, um, in the last meeting, there were numerous concerned parents in attendance. Many of those parents are looking for alternatives due to their frustrations and concerns not being heard. Parents want to know what their kids are learned, being taught, how they are being taught, who is teaching them, and that they all align with their family values, their family's values. If this standard is adopted, there will be a mass exodus of students from the public school system including this district. This new standard is not consistent with the Cannon Falls District mission statement that's on the wall in this room. Cannon Falls area schools partnering with families and community will provide a safe, nurturing, challenging, and inspiring environment to educate all individuals to be lifelong learners and responsible, productive citizens. The review period for this new Dawn, standard... We've got five minutes yep. up now. The Close review it off. period for this standard closes on Monday, August 16th, so next Monday. I'm surprised that this was not a discussion in any of your school board meetings. If it was, maybe in a committee meeting, I don't know. But I am asking that the school board resolve to re recommend that these new social study standards not be adopted by the Minnesota Department of Education prior to closing of the review period. If this board cannot do that as one body tonight, I know it's kind of late notice, then I ask that each of you express your own general opinion of the standard by Monday through the Minnesota Department of Education. We're good. We're past your time. I appreciate your input, and if we let everybody go there, we'll be and here until tomorrow. And I want to submit this because it lists Lay very, it out. Lay it out here. very uh, <laughs> specifically what standards are threatening. Okay. Um, Dawn, not that I meant to cut you off, mm -hmm. but we do have numbers here. There's a gentleman in the back with a white shirt that raised his hand who's been awfully quiet this evening. Okay. My name is Chris Dobson, um, and I, I got the information about the mask stuff and everything in the later meeting, but I just had a question, or just want to say, I was watching PBS NewsHour, and it was Dr. Dan Benjamin, professor of pediatrics at, at Duke University, and he said that in settings with mandatory masks, Transmissions are less than 1%. I'm just going to say, I think you should need to take the lead and make it mandatory. Don't have any discussion about it. Because we can't have another shutdown. It was devastating for these kids. Uh, my stepson had a horrible time last year. And I don't want to see that happen again to anybody. And I think the free and reduced lunch kids will have an even worse time because they don't have resources at home. Okay. That's all I got. Thank you. No. Um, the, the three okay. minute rule was in effect. Just Go a ahead. couple points. No, we had on. a mandatory mask mandate already. It didn't work. Why would we do something that didn't work? Let's, uh, let's point Secondly, this way. Um, how long are we tied up into this uh, A and I program? Whatever you want to call it. It's a three year uh, plan. Three year. But we're not, so, but and again, we're not. Out. This is not a Q and A right now, as stated on here. You make your opinion known. We'll go back and get information and answer you back. Otherwise, it'll digress okay. into something we don't want. I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Linda, yeah, I, I just took the time to write it out, Let's, so you can pass it out. Multiple copies. Good. Yes, okay. there's eight copies. There's only seven of you, so okay. But it's all to do with the COVID-19 plan in Canada Falls, and so I just wanted to have my little say because I know I'm not alone in this because we stand at the brink of a new school year, we're hearing some bold statements about how we're going to deal with the virus among us, and we're all a bit wiser after these last 18 months. Um, we've all seen and felt the effects, of course, changes and new mandates and adjusting our responses, and it's been like riding a roller coaster, and I really don't like roller coasters, and most of us have learned not to. What we need is to act upon principles and scientific facts, not constant guesswork sure that you're doing that in your committee, continuing to use the recommendations of the MDH, Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC as our sources of information are only keeping us on that roller coaster. Why? Because they're not actually as scientific based as we all hoped. So we need, I can barely find one recommendation from them that is supported by the 
the time-tested rules of science. What do we know? We know the coronavirus, as any other respiratory virus, is spread by aerosol particles, which are small enough to go through any mask here. The NIH has performed at least three studies that support this fact, and yet they refuse to uh, abide by them. I'm sure you know by now the viral infection rate among children is less than 1%. I'm sure you know by now that the adverse effects of this vaccine can cause many more serious lifelong and even deadly problems. A simple search on the VAERS database should be enough to shock anyone. I'm sure you know by now that there are effective and inexpensive treatments for these symptoms of this virus. And in many cases, for our young people, it's, it, it, doesn't, it comes and goes without even almost knowing about it. There are exceptions, of course. The CDC has managed to convince everybody that we can handle this and stop the spread. We can't make the virus go away any more than we can make the flu or a cold go away. Vaccinations, even if it were more effective, and to, tonight I just saw on the news that it's 45% effective for the Pfizer and only 70-some percent effective for the Moderna. Okay, even if they were more effective, can't change and make the virus go away. It's actually frightening that a vaccine is supposed to be, um, that's supposedly supposed to be effective, has having all these breakouts now. So I'm asking the board to, uh, to consider this con question. Why do we believe we can control or contain this virus any more effectively than flu, colds, respiratory viruses, the vaccine isn't going to help. When do we need to, when do we stop listening to the MDH and the CDC? That's we right. can't make it go away. So I encourage our Cannon Falls High School Board, because you represent us, not the Minnesota Department of Education, and staff to take this opportunity to step up and take the lead in educating and good health practices once again, to wash, to, to um, eat a good diet. None of these things have been uh, emphasized the good hygiene and nutrition. So please, no masks, no distance learning in our Cannon Falls schools. Let's take the lead in this so our children can learn good health practices once again. Okay. Who else would like, like to speak? We're closing the public input. You know, when we... Uh, when we have meetings like this, if you've been tuned in anywhere on a, on a state level or a national level, you see that it's, it's exploded into emotion. And, you know, we commend you for coming here, whether your opinions to us are valid or, or whether we uh, don't agree with them. You came in here for a general purpose of being heard. And we, pre we appreciate how civil you've been, and the interaction you've been has been both professional, professional and knowledgeable. So thank you for that. And uh, again, we read about some of these states that have been, uh, have discussed with their constituency, in particular a couple states that say, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do this, school boards Eight political school boards have stepped up and said, we don't care, we're going to do what's right for the kids. And whether you agree with that concept or not, um, school boards attempt, especially in a small town, to be apolitical and do things for their kids. And that's what we try to do here. And it doesn't always uh, work out as you want to, but we're doing the best we can, and we appreciate you coming here and discussing it with us. Um, we are finished for the evening. I would like a motion to adjourn. I would like to make that motion, Bob. A second. <laughs> you know how interesting it is. The AC comes on in the last third of our meeting. I know, I, I know, know that. I've been dying here for a while. Who seconded that? Brenda. Thank you, Brenda. We have a motion to second on the floor to close our meeting for the evening. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We are finished. Thanks again.